Now, uh, my mission in life is to help you and everyone who needs my help, but I can never give you that for which you are not ready. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. Let me call your attention to a great power which is under your control, a power which is greater than poverty, greater than the lack of education, greater than all of your fears and superstitions combined. It is the power to take possession of your own mind and direct it to whatever ends you may desire. Poverty, fear, illiteracy, and superstition. The four horsemen which keep most people in bondage all the days of their lives. Faith is not something you get. Faith is something you already have. But you may be using it in reverse gear by believing in the circumstances and things you do not want, the things you fear. poverty and lack of education, you are simply directing your mind power to attract these undesirable circumstances. Because it is true that whatever your mind feeds upon, your mind attracts to you. Now you see why it is important that you recognize that all success begins with definiteness of purpose, with a clear picture in your mind of precisely what you want from life. Everyone comes to the earth plane blessed with the privilege of controlling his mind power and directing it to whatever ends he may choose. Your only limitations are those which you set up in your own mind or permit others to set up for you. Your faith is limited only by your own capacity to believe. Faith is guidance only. It is not a power which will bring you what you want, but a power that can guide you to go after what you want and get it. There is no such thing as something for nothing. Everything, including your personal success, has a price that must be paid. A negative mental attitude can bring you nothing but failure. Remember also, your mental attitude is the one and the only thing over which you have complete control. Success is something which has to be planned, and success is something which has to be earned in advance. True, there is such a thing as luck, but just remember that luck is something you can create for yourself if you know the rules and follow them, and the best definition of success which I know is this. Success is the knowledge with which to get whatever you want from life without violating the rights of others and by helping others to acquire it. Your only real limitation is the one you accept and set up in your own mind. The habit of going the extra mile definitely develops greater self-reliance and gives one more courage to move ahead without the fear of criticism from others. It helps you to master the destructive habit of procrastination, know what you want and believe that you can and will get it. Give expressions of gratitude many times daily for having received that which you want, even before you actually get physical possession of it. Possession starts first in the mind. There can be no application of applied faith without action. When overtaken by defeat, as you may be many times, remember that man's faith is tested many times before he is crowned with final victory. And accept your defeat as nothing more than a challenge to keep on trying.
I can give you a fine example of how nature forces man to go the extra mile in order that he may produce the food with which to exist. The farmer, for example, must follow the habit of clearing the ground, fencing it, plowing it, and planting the seed at the right season of the year, all of which he must do in advance without compensation of any kind. If he does his part of the work properly, he then hands the job over to nature, sits down and waits for her to do her part, and within a brief period, nature yields back to him the seed he planted, plus perhaps an increase of a hundred times that amount to compensate him for having gone the extra mile. Thus we see that the law of increasing returns comes to the aid of the man who goes the extra mile. I say this is your greatest asset with which you may tap and draw upon the supreme power which created you and runs this entire universe. The name of this principle is applied faith and I want you to remember it. it is not something I am bringing to you but it is something you already possess although you may not have made use of it in the past. Applied faith is the mental attitude wherein you may clear your mind of all fears and doubts and direct it to the attainment of whatever you desire in life. Applied faith is a mental attitude we must cultivate and maintain before we can take complete possession of our minds. We are now, this very moment, standing in front of the gateway which can be opened only with the great master key to success, applied faith. Most people make a negative application of their great power of faith by thinking about and believing in poverty, ill health, fear, failure, and defeat, when it would be so easy for them just to change their thinking over to the circumstances and things they desire. many times the average person must fail before he quits. Fails because of the lack of capacity for belief. How many times can you meet with defeat before you give up and quit? Belief is truly a magic word because it is the beginning of all success. It is the very foundation of civilization. It is the one quality you must develop before you can make use of the great master key to success. To be successful, you must become a person with a great capacity for belief. And the place to start believing is with yourself. You should begin by recognizing that you were born with the privilege of complete control over your own mind. You can take full possession of your mind and make it yield you whatever you demand in life. If your life is not what you want it to be, you can change it. As a matter of fact, you can do anything within reason that you desire to do if you embrace the principle of applied faith and keep it directed to the attainment of the things you want and off the things you do not want.
To seek on the outside for that which you do not feel you are is to seek in vain, for we never find that which we want. We find only that which we are. Feeling is the secret. A clearly defined road to the realization of your dreams. Through our imagination and our feelings, we consciously or unconsciously mold outer circumstance in harmony with our inner nature. Personal success will prove far more convincing than all the books that could be written on the subject. The world and all within it is man's conditioned consciousness objectified. Consciousness is the cause as well as the substance of the entire world. Knowledge of the law of consciousness and the method of operating this law will enable you to accomplish all you desire in life. Armed with a working knowledge of this law, you can build and maintain an ideal world. Consciousness is the one and only reality, not figuratively, but actually. This reality may, for the sake of clarity, be likened unto a stream which is divided into two parts, the conscious and the subconscious. The conscious is personal and selective. The subconscious is impersonal and non-selective. The conscious generates ideas and impresses these ideas on the subconscious. The subconscious receives ideas and gives form and expression to them. All things evolve out of consciousness, and without this sequence, there is not anything made that is made. The conscious impresses the subconscious, while the subconscious expresses all that is impressed upon it. The subconscious does not originate ideas, but accepts as true those which the conscious mind feels to be true. Therefore, through his power to imagine and feel, and his freedom to choose the idea he will entertain, man has control over creation. Control of the subconscious is accomplished through control of your ideas and feelings. The subconscious transcends reason and is independent of induction. It contemplates a feeling as a fact existing within itself, and on this assumption proceeds to give expression to it. The creative process begins with an idea and its cycle runs its course as a feeling and ends in a volition to act. Ideas are impressed on the subconscious through the medium of feeling. No idea can be impressed on the subconscious until it is felt, but once felt, be it good, bad, or indifferent, it must be expressed. Feeling is the one and only medium through which ideas are conveyed to the subconscious. Therefore, the man who does not control his feeling may easily impress the subconscious with undesirable states. By control of feeling is not meant restraint or suppression of your feeling, but rather the disciplining of self to imagine and entertain only such feeling as contributes to your happiness. Control of your feeling is all important to a full and happy life. Never entertain an undesirable feeling, nor think sympathetically about wrong in any shape or form. 
Do not dwell on the imperfection of yourself or others. To do so is to impress the subconscious with these limitations. Every feeling makes a subconscious impression, and unless it is counteracted by a more powerful feeling of an opposite nature, must be expressed. I am healthy is a stronger feeling than I will be healthy. To feel I will be is to confess I am not. I am is stronger than I am not. What you feel you are always dominates what you feel you would like to be. Therefore, to be realized, the wish must be felt as a state that is rather than a state that is not. Sensation precedes manifestation and is the foundation upon which all manifestation rests. Be careful of your moods and feelings, for there is an unbroken connection between your feelings and your visible world. Your body is an emotional filter and bears the unmistakable marks of your prevalent emotions. Think feelingly only of the state you desire to realize. A change of feeling is a change of destiny. All creation occurs in the domain of the subconscious. What you must acquire, then, is a reflective control of the operation of the subconscious. That is, control of your ideas and feelings. Chance or accident is not responsible for the things that happen to you, nor is predestined fate the author of your fortune or misfortune. Your subconscious impressions determine the conditions of your world. The subconscious is not selective. It is impersonal and no respecter of persons. The subconscious is not concerned with the truth or falsity of your feeling. It always accepts as true that which you feel to be true. Feeling is the assent of the subconscious to the truth of that which is declared to be true. There is nothing impossible to man. Your feelings create the pattern from which your world is fashioned and a change of feeling is a change of pattern. The subconscious never fails to express that which has been impressed upon it. It accepts the feeling impressed upon it, your feeling, as a fact existing within itself. The subconscious never alters the accepted beliefs of man. It outpictures them to the last detail whether or not they are beneficial. To impress the subconscious with the desirable state, you must assume the feeling that would be yours had you already realized your wish. The manner of expression or the difficulties involved are not to be considered by you. To think feelingly on any state impresses it on the subconscious. Therefore, if you dwell on difficulties, barriers, or delay, the subconscious, by its very non-selective nature, accepts the feeling of difficulties and obstacles as your request and proceeds to produce them in your outer world.
The subconscious is the womb of creation. It receives the idea unto itself through the feelings of man. It never changes the idea received, but always gives it form. It is eternally true that the outside mirrors the inside. As within, so without. Nothing comes from without. All things come from within. Your world in its every detail is your consciousness objectified. Mastery of self-control of your thoughts and feelings is your highest achievement. Until perfect self-control is attained so that, in spite of appearances, you feel all that you want to feel. You never draw out of the deep of yourself that which you want. You always draw that which you are. And you are that which you feel yourself to be. The life that occupies one-third of our stay on Earth is the natural door into the subconscious. The conscious two-thirds of our life on Earth is measured by the degree of attention we give sleep. Our understanding of and delight in what sleep has to bestow will cause us, night after night, to set out for it as though we were keeping an appointment with a lover. Whatever you have in consciousness as you go to sleep is the measure of your expression in the waking two-thirds of your life on Earth. Once asleep, man has no freedom of choice. His entire slumber is dominated by his last waking concept of self. It follows, therefore, that he should always assume the feeling of accomplishment and satisfaction before he retires in sleep. Your mood prior to sleep defines your state of consciousness as you enter into the presence of your everlasting lover the subconscious. She sees you exactly as you feel yourself to be. If, as you prepare for sleep, you assume and maintain the consciousness of success by feeling, I am successful, you must be successful. Sleep is the door through which the conscious waking mind passes to be creatively joined to the subconscious. Preparing to sleep, you feel yourself into the state of the answered wish, and then relax into unconsciousness. You seek the feeling of the wish fulfilled, that you may take it with you into the chamber of her that conceived you, into sleep, or the subconscious which gave you form, that this wish also may be given expression. This is the way to discover and conduct your wishes into the subconscious. Feel yourself in the state of the realized wish and quietly drop off to sleep. Never go to sleep feeling discouraged or dissatisfied. 
never sleep in the consciousness of failure. Your subconscious, whose natural state is sleep, sees you as you believe yourself to be. And whether it be good, bad, or indifferent, the subconscious will faithfully embody your belief. Do not limit yourself to the past. Knowing that nothing is impossible to consciousness, begin to imagine states beyond the experiences of the past. Whatever the mind of man can imagine, man can realize. Always imagine and expect the best. The world cannot change until you change your conception of it. As within, so without. You have no one to change but yourself. And you have neither opponent nor helper in bringing about the change within yourself. You have nothing to do but convince yourself of the truth of that which you desire to see manifested. A change of belief is confirmed by a change of expression. Every night as you drop off to sleep, feel satisfied and spotless, for your subjective lover always forms the objective world in the image and likeness of your conception of it, the conception defined by your feelings. You are an eternal dreamer, dreaming non-eternal dreams. Your dreams take form as you assume the feeling of their reality. The waking two-thirds of your life on Earth ever corroborates or bears witness to your subconscious impressions. Do not waste one moment in regret, for to think feelingly of the mistakes of the past is to reinfect yourself. Let the dead bury the dead. Every action and event of the day is predetermined by your concept of self as you fell asleep. Your only freedom, then, is your freedom of reaction. You are free to choose how you feel and react to the day's drama, but the drama, the actions, events, and circumstances of the day have already been determined. Unless you consciously and purposely define the attitude of mind with which you go to sleep, you unconsciously go to sleep in the composite attitude of mind made up of all feelings and reactions of the day. Your conception of yourself as you fall asleep is the seed you drop into the ground of the subconscious. Dropping off to sleep feeling satisfied and happy compels conditions and events to appear in your world which confirm these attitudes of mind. What you take in as a feeling, you bring out as a condition, action, or object in space. Through his power to imagine and feel, and his freedom to choose the idea he will entertain, man has control over creation. Control of the subconscious is accomplished through control of your ideas and feelings. Feeling is the one and only medium through which ideas are conveyed to the subconscious. Therefore, the man who does not control his feeling may easily impress the subconscious with undesirable states. By control of feeling is not meant restraint or suppression of your feeling, but rather the disciplining of self 
to imagine and entertain only such feeling as contributes to your happiness. Within you, whoever you may be, is the ability and the power to do whatever you need to do to be happy and successful. Within you right now is the power to do things you never dreamed possible. This power becomes available to you just as soon as you can change your beliefs. Just as quickly as you can dehypnotize yourself from the ideas of I can't, I'm not worthy, I don't deserve it, and other self-limiting ideas. The truth about you is this. You are not inferior. You are not superior. You are simply you. You, as a personality, are not in competition with any other personality, simply because there is not another person on the face of the earth like you or in your particular class. You are an individual. You are unique. You are not like any other person and can never become like any other person. You are not supposed to be like any other person and no other person is supposed to be like you. There is no common man, no standardized common pattern. It is no exaggeration to say that all human beings are hypnotized to some extent, either by ideas they have uncritically accepted from others, or by ideas they have repeated to themselves or convinced themselves are true. These negative ideas have exactly the same effect on our behavior as the negative ideas implanted into the mind of a hypnotized subject by a professional hypnotist. We found that hypnotic subjects are able to do surprising things only when convinced that the hypnotist's words are true statements. When the hypnotist has guided the subject to the point where he is convinced that the hypnotist's words are true statements, the subject then behaves differently because he thinks and believes differently. But if you've accepted an idea from yourself, your teachers, your parents, friends, advertisements, or any other source, and further, if you are firmly convinced that idea is true, it has the same power over you as the hypnotist's words have over the hypnotized subject. It is not about fraud, but a search for hidden truth. Every person on the face of the earth is inferior to some other persons or person. Every person I meet, from the newsboy on the corner to the president of the bank, is superior to me in certain respects. This does not, however, make me an inferior person. We have allowed ourselves to be hypnotized by the entirely erroneous idea that I should be like so-and-so, or I should be like everybody else. You can't win by playing not to lose. Once a decision is made, focus on supporting it, not second-guessing it. I have spent my whole life scared, frightened of things that could happen, might happen, might not happen. Fifty years I spent like that. Finding myself awake at three in the morning. I came to realize it's that fear that's the worst of it. That's the real enemy. Ideas are changed not by will, but by other ideas. Memories of past failures can adversely affect present performance if we dwell on them. I failed yesterday, therefore I will fail again today. The minute that we change our minds and stop giving power to the past, the past, with its mistakes, loses its power over us. Poor grades in school are in almost every case due in some degree to students' self-conception and self-definition. These students had been literally hypnotized by such ideas as, I am dumb, I am poor in arithmetic, I am a naturally poor speller, I do not have a mechanical type mind, etc. 
With such self-definitions, students had to make poor grades in order to be true to themselves. It would be as wrong from their viewpoint for them to make good grades as it would be to steal if they define themselves as honest persons. Remember that this hypnotic programming gains permanence by coming from an authoritative source, through repetition and through intensity. Deprogramming and reprogramming requires you to provide these very same factors. You are very, very strong. Stronger than you have ever been in your life. Much, much stronger. You are surprised at how strong you are. Stop measuring yourself against their standards. You are not them and can never measure up. Neither can they measure up to your standards, nor should they. Your objective should not be to feel superior to others, nor should you continue permitting feelings of inferiority to others. Your objective is to develop your own unique personality and accomplishments. Examine and reevaluate your beliefs. Trace down the belief about yourself, about the world, or about other people that is behind your negative behavior. Does something always happen to cause you to miss out just when success seems within your grasp? Perhaps you secretly feel unworthy of success, or that you do not deserve it. Perhaps you believe that the world you live in is a hostile, unfriendly, dangerous place, or that you deserve punishment. These reasons are not reasons based on current rational thought at all. They're just beliefs, subject to change. Remember that both behavior and feeling spring from belief. Is there some task you would like to do, some channel in which you would like to express yourself, but you hang back feeling that, I can't. Ask yourself, why? Why do I believe that I can't? Then ask yourself, is this belief based on an actual fact, or on an assumption, or a false conclusion? Is there any rational reason for such a belief? Could it be that I am mistaken in this belief? Would I come to the same conclusion about some other person in a similar situation? Why should I continue to act and feel as if this were true, if there's no good reason to believe it? Don't just pass these questions by casually. Wrestle with them. Think hard on them. Get emotional about them. Can you see that you have cheated yourself and sold yourself short, not because of a fact, but only because of an irrational and erroneous belief? If so, try to arouse some indignation or even anger. Indignation and anger can sometimes act as liberators from false ideas. Many of us unconsciously and unwittingly, by holding negative attitudes and habitually picturing failure to ourselves in our imagination, set up goals of failure. We use deliberate, rational, conscious thought to choose the target. Then we use the imagination to communicate the target to the self-image in a manner that it will be accepted and acted upon. All skill learning is accomplished by trial and error. By making a trial, missing the mark, consciously remembering the degree of error, and making correction on the next trial, until finally a hit or successful attempt is accomplished. The successful reaction pattern is then remembered or recalled and imitated on future trials. Thus, all servo mechanisms by their very nature, contain memories of past errors, failures, 
painful and negative experience. These negative experiences do not inhibit, but contribute to the learning process. As long as they are used properly as negative feedback data and are seen as deviations from the positive goal desired. It is equally important that the error be consciously forgotten and the successful attempt remembered and dwelt upon. Our errors, mistakes, failures, and sometimes even our humiliations were necessary steps in the learning process. However, they were meant to be a means to an end, not an end in themselves. When they have served their purpose, they should be forgotten. The unhappiest of mortals are those who insist on reliving the past over and over in their imagination, continually criticizing themselves for past mistakes, continually condemning themselves for past sin. I do not think it coincidental that pain and the deep-seated belief that you should not suffer great indignities are the triggers that most quickly or easily and definitively motivate people to action. Knowing this, you can use it to motivate yourself to constructive action. It is the job of conscious, rational thought to decide what you want, select the goals you wish to achieve, and concentrate on these rather than on what you do not want. Decide what you want, not what you don't want. Determine that the thing can and shall be done, and then we shall find the way. Each of us has genius within, in most cases waiting to be awakened, liberated, energized, and utilized. Right now, being a genius might not be part of your self-image, but soon I hope it will be.